Come on, are you with me? There's something about his name. Something about his name. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. There is life and death in the tongue. And when we just call on his name, I don't care what's going on. If you just call on his name, there's peace in the midst of the storm. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's dig in. Uh, we've been talking about God is establishing this house to be a house of impact. Impact is when you affect something or someone around you through something going on in your life or quite simply in this case because of the presence of God. And we have not been called, I've, I've been saying this now for over a decade, God has not called me to be a part of any kind of religious social club. And there are, there are no, there are no, there's, okay, there's a church for everybody. Um, and we haven't necessarily been called to be for everybody. Um, we are not everybody's cup of tea. You get the, you, you understand that, uh, and there are enough uh, religious social clubs in America to last us a lifetime. There, there are enough churches playing. Uh, I don't have time to play. Uh, there, there are enough that are not um, preaching through the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and that are what Paul called um, itching the ears. Um, and so you can build your church by people liking what you say and do, or you can get out the way and let God build his church. And it's the church God builds that the gates of hell shall not prevail against. So I don't want to be a part of a religious social club. Religious social club, you, you show up, you see people you like, you feel good, you leave, and that's where it ends. I want to raise up a church that impacts every single life around us. And uh, I felt called to do this series because a lot of times people are like, well, what's the vision? And, and even the people, I have no idea. Um, I don't want you to be clueless about the vision. So that's what this series is. It's the vision of the house. We're called to be a house of impact, to love God to love people, and to make an impact. So what does that impact look like? So we've been talking about the word impact. The I of impact uh, stood for inspiration and influence. Inspiration, meaning the breath of God, and influence, making an impact one life at a time. Uh, the M of impact, uh, we talked about a, uh, being a house of movement and miracles, um, a movement, not stagnant, not stale, but a movement. And in this house, miracles take place. Amen. Amen. I mean, how can you say it's a miracle you made it this week? Amen. 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 And and our God to God of miracles. Uh, a couple of Sundays ago, we talked about the P of impact, which means passionately planted. We're not here because we have to be. We love our church. We love the people that are around us. And we love to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. And we are getting our roots deep down into this soil. Amen? Amen. Amen. And then last week we talked about being active and anointed. Uh, to be active means to demonstrate the kingdom of God. And to be anointed means that in this place, burdens are removed and yokes are destroyed. Amen. And, um, and everybody's yoke and everybody's burden isn't the same. But it's the same anointing that removes the burdens and destroys the yokes. And, uh, that's, and that's the difference in this house is the anointing. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so that brings us to the letter C. Say that C. C. Uh, which means celebration. We are a house of celebration. And so we're going to talk about that today. And uh, I'm going to show you in the Bible how a house that celebrates is one that God takes pleasure in. Amen. And so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit today. Look at Psalm 51. 
Psalm 51, verse 10 and ver- verse 11 and 12. Verse 10 says this, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Here it is. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with your willing spirit. A house of celebration is a house that is full of of joy Uh, a celebration is joy being expressed and God has not called us to be a house of depression he's called us to be a house of celebration so let's talk about it today a house of celebration I want to begin with this statement (laughs) something is wrong when the world is happy And the church is sad. Something is incredibly wrong with our perception of God and who we are in Him. If it's okay to celebrate for occasions the world says is worthy to be celebrated. But then criticize when... The church celebrates what really is the only thing worthy to be celebrated. And that is lives changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Something's very wrong. Uh, I was in a church one time and I didn't, I didn't celebrate. I, didn't, I wasn't obnoxious. I wasn't boisterous. I just simply sat in the pew and lifted one hand. And I was very quickly reminded by an usher, we don't do that here. But that same usher, if he was at a ball game, are are you with me? I'm trying trying to let you know it's okay to celebrate in this house. That's what I'm saying. We're a house of celebration. Because that's what the Bible says. Restore to me the joy. Joy, there has to be expression when there's joy, right? Where there's joy, there's laughter, <laughs> celebration. Uh, and, and so this is what I want to say. Celebration has a volume to it. When you are at a party, there's a volume to it. You ever been to a party that was boring? And you're like, man, so, somebody turn up the music, right? Right? Because it was too quiet. Because if it's a celebration, why are we acting like we're at a library? <laughs> right? And so, but sometimes we think, we think, here, here it is. We think reverence is quiet. Did you know I can be reverent and loud at the same time? Right. Somebody rebuked me one time when I preached along these lines. And they said, well... Well, young man, they said, uh, they said, you know, God ain't deaf. There's no need for you to be that loud. And I just simply replied, but he's not nervous either. God ain't got, God don't got anxiety. God's not socially awkward. Volume doesn't bother him. As a matter of fact, he said, if we hold our peace, the rocks would cry out in our place. Can I tell you, God loves it when his children celebrate him. And that's what we are called to be, a house of celebration. You and I have a reason to celebrate. Amen? I mean, we got a reason to get excited about something. Why? Because we once were lost. Now we're found. We once were blind. Now we can see. I mean, to tell you, I mean, some of us knows what it's like to be under a heavy hand of bondage and then he came and set us free and we've got a reason to celebrate. I told you of my friend Jed Hill tried to commit suicide four times, the fourth time from the prison cell. And the nurse even wrote up in the morgue, in the prison morgue, his death certificate when God opened his eyes. God refused to let him die. And then a month ago, 
stood in the same prison cell and preached to the other prisoners. Come on. Man, that's what I'm talking about. That's worthy to be celebrated. I've got a reason to get excited. Amen. I shouldn't be here. So I'm going to celebrate because I'm still here. Amen. I mean, some of you got to realize life ain't that bad. Some people, not too many around here, but some people walk into church, my goodness. They look like they swallowed a whole gallon of dill pickle juice (laughs) on their way to church. Sour, upset. Why? You get to come to church. You get to praise Him today. You get to hear the Word of God today. Life ain't that bad. Stop listening to secular media that tells you life is bad. Stop, turn them off and open up a Bible and realize no matter who's president, he's king. Okay. Celebrate. So let, let's break that down. What does the word celebrate mean? I want to give you three definitions. To celebrate means, number one, to make known. To make known. Number two, it means to show praise. And number three, it means to throw a party. Oh, but Pastor Tim, I thought this was church. Oh, hold on. I got scripture for you. Can I tell you something? God loves it when his children throw him a party. Because can I tell you something? He's thrown us a party. A matter of fact, he's planning a party. Matter of fact, there's coming a time when Gabriel's going to grab his trumpet. And he's going to sound the alarm. You and I are getting out of here. And matter of fact, we're going to something called the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been to weddings whose receptions were just awful. I mean, boring horrible food, bad music, a DJ who thought he was funny and wasn't. Everybody's been to a reception like that. But how many knows what a good wedding, it's it's a good party because they're celebrating something very special. Okay, so it's okay to have a good time in the presence of God. I want you to know that. It's all right. It's all right. You're not going to make anybody nervous around here if you shout and get loud. You're not going to make anybody really, well, I don't think this should be happening. If you just get a little exuberant while you praise God, I'm just going to tell you, it's all right to jump up and down. It's all right to throw your hands up. It's all right to spin around like a crazy person. It's all right to shout. It's all right to dance. It's all right to celebrate. What's not all right is to act like he's dead. What's not all right is to act like he's never done anything for you. Because what if today was the last day you had a chance to tell him thank you? It would change how you celebrate. And here's the thing. The celebration is not the king of our celebration. Jesus is the king of our celebration. Well, Pastor Tim, now this sounds like fanaticism. No, no, let me explain to you the difference between celebration and fanaticism. Fanaticism is celebrating with no understanding of why you're celebrating. Fanaticism is getting caught up with what other people know to be true. That's fanaticism. It's like people's excitement spills over on you, and you start getting excited because they're excited. You don't know why they're excited, but they're excited. So, woo, let's get excited. That's fanaticism. But celebration is I'm celebrating Because I know who he is. I'm celebrate him because I know what he's done for me. I celebrate him. I made up my mind a long time ago. I was about 12 years old. And uh, I was looking around and and my dad pastored this little country church in, in, in the middle of nowhere in the state of Maine. And, uh, and, and revival hit the youth group, and we were all getting filled with the Holy Ghost, and we were experiencing all these wonderful things. And I, look, I, I made them, I always sat on the front row. I like to sit on the front row because I don't like to be distracted by the people that are in front of me that are talking instead of worshiping. 
and, and different things. Everybody's kind of like in a different place. And so this one Sunday, I made the mistake. I was on the front row, and I turned around, and I realized the only people that were really feeling it was the youth group and this one particular Sunday. And can I tell you something? I just sat there, and I was borderline depressed because I, I, I didn't understand why if the same Holy Spirit that was touching all of us kids was in the room, I don't understand how you can just not be affected by that Holy Spirit. I never understood that. So I, go, so I, did, I got nothing out of the service. I just sat there. and I'm, I mean, I was in a bad mood, dude. I mean, I was like, like don't talk to me. Don't look. As soon as church was over, we lived across the parking lot from the church. And so as soon as church was over, I didn't even say goodbye to nobody. I went home. I was shut myself in the room. I'm 12. Give me some grace. I shut myself in the room, and I was just upset. I wasn't crying upset. I was red in the face, steam coming out my ears, upset. Y'all know what I'm saying? And my father comes home after some time and he said, what, what is your deal? What, what's wrong with you? Why are you so upset? And I said, did you not see what I saw? And he said, well, what did you see? I said, I saw a large majority of people that were not pressing into God other than the youth group. And it bothered me. I said, it, it, it ruined the whole service for me. And he said, I would say two things to you. First of all, anytime you get your eyes on people and not on Jesus, you're going to get upset. He said, secondly, stop worrying about what they're not doing and don't wait for them. Lead the charge and go hot after God yourself and make them decide whether or not they're going to let a 12-year-old show them up. That's what my father said to me. I took it to heart. So I called my friend. His name was Morgan. I called Morgan. Morgan was funny. Morgan always wanted to be my twin. He was eight inches shorter than me, quite a little bit heavier than me, but he always wanted to be my twin. He'd call me on Sunday afternoon. Tim, church tonight. Yeah, what about it? What are you wearing? And I was like, I don't know what I'm wearing. And he's like, make a decision. And I was like, okay. So this one Sunday, I said, I'm wearing black pants, white shirt, black suspenders, black tie. And he was like, okay, I'll see you at church. Here comes Morgan in on a Sunday night, black pants, white shirt, black suspenders, black tie. I said, what in the world are you doing? And he's like, whatever you've got, I want it. He goes, so I'm just going to, I want to be as close to you. I said, no, 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 you need to get close to Jesus, man. And so, so I called Morgan and I said, Morgan, I said, have you noticed some of the, of, of the other folks aren't pressing into God? And he goes, yeah, it's been bothering me. I said, tonight, we don't look at nobody else. We focus on Jesus. So we went in there and can I tell you something? The Holy Ghost started to move and we started to feel it. And at first, I started to feel this sound coming out of me. And then I was like, I don't want, I was also not wanting to be heard. And so I was like, I don't want people to hear me. So I settled down a little bit. And then I started to hear voices I had never heard in that church. And, and I, I did look around and I saw this person. They were about 60 years old. And they, now I, I think they were 60. They were probably 40. Uh, <laughs> I was 12. Okay, 60s looking younger by the day, praise God. And, uh, and so I happened to catch, and they were lost in worship. I asked them after church, I said, why did you act like this tonight? I said, I've never seen you praise God like that. And he said, well, I got to thinking this afternoon how on fire you guys are, and it's going to be over my dead body that you pass me in getting into the presence of God. <laughs> Can I tell you something? It started to spill out in the whole congregation. And so here's the thing. If you're here and you're like, man, these, some of these people are crazy. I mean, you look at, I mean, I'm just going to give you some examples. You look at my boys and they're just jumping like, they, you know, like what's their problem? Like they're just excited. And, and you said, should that or should that not be happening? You take somebody who, who's not of a tender age like Jerry Spires. He's not of a tender age. He's a mature man, 
But my God, as soon as the anointing of the Holy Ghost comes in the room, he's the loudest one in the building. Right? And so, so here's the thing. If we put on the mindset of, well, I don't think that's necessary, we miss the whole point of what they're doing. We miss the whole point. Some of us aren't loud because we're just trying to be loud. Some of us are just grateful. And it causes us to make a sound. Are you with me? So what? Jesus is the king of our celebration. Listen to what Zephaniah says. Zephaniah 3.17. The Lord your God is in your midst. A mighty one who will save. He'll rejoice over you with gladness. He'll renew you with his love. He'll rejoice over you with singing. Now this, now watch this. He says, he's in our midst, not we have come into his midst. But the king has come into our midst, and watch this, and the people began to celebrate, because when the king came into the midst, the king began to celebrate. Listen to what it says about God. He will rejoice over you with gladness. Rejoicing has a volume to it. He will renew you with his love and he will rejoice over you with singing. You think that we're the only ones that are singing over God? God's the one that has come into our midst and is singing over us. That's the celebration. It is not God sitting there saying, yes, make a big sound. Make it all about me. God is saying, when you rejoice in me, I rejoice in you. When you sing to me, I sing back over you. No wonder it's a celebration. I mean, you ever been to a party and somebody got the feeling it? And they just started to sing or to dance like really out there? Huh? I mean, I, I, I know somebody, they couldn't carry a tune in a bucket with handles. But that doesn't stop them from singing. Come on. Some of you are like, well, I, can't, I don't want to be that loud in church because I, I'm, I'm not a great singer. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. All ye lands. God's not nervous. Amen. There, now listen, there is a time for a holy hush. There is a time for the sweet presence of the Lord to come in and still your heart. But there's also a time for us to open up our mouths wide with praise and celebrate him. The Bible says the king is in our midst. If you don't have any other reason to celebrate but that, the king is in our midst. I mean, you, I mean, you felt it during the last song. The presence of God was in this place, in our midst. Do you, do you realize, I mean, there is, oh, goodness, what was that song? My father used to do his best to sing that song. Here it is. Reach out and touch the Lord as he walks by. You'll find he's not too busy to hear your heart's cry. Watch this. Here it is. For he's passing by this moment your needs to supply. So reach out and touch the Lord as he walks by. Do you understand that's what you feel in this building? Is the presence of the king walking by. We had a lady that had a vision not that long ago. She comes to me and she's never really had a vision. Uh, and, and she said it was the Sunday where we, that we had healings and miracles happen all over the altar just a few Sundays ago. And she said it was just before, just before I called out healing. She looked up and right in front of me, she saw the stature of a man from behind with brown hair below his shoulders a long white robe and a bright light surrounding all around him. And she said he started to walk back and forth in the altar 
And then he got in the rows and started to walk back and forth among the people. You don't have to believe that if you don't want to. But you know what I believe she saw? Jesus himself. And that was a Sunday. I can't tell you how many healings took place that Sunday morning. Okay? If that's not worth celebrating, let's, let's talk about some testimonies around here of what God has done and tell me he's not worth celebrating. Huh? I got people, I'm not going to start naming names, but I got people in this church not that long ago were locked up. They're now free. I got people in this church that were addicted to all types of drugs. And now they're clean and sober and filled with the Holy Spirit. We got a lady that had chronic back pain for 50 years. No more. If that's not worth celebrating, I don't know what is. And I don't want to offend anybody. But whatever the chiefs are going to do today is not worth the celebration. But when lives are changed and bodies are healed and something transpires in this house, that's worth celebrating. Why? Because the king is in our midst. Have you ever walked into this room and suddenly just felt he's already here? That's worth celebrating. So for some of our newer folks, this is why some of us are loud. Because we know he's in our midst. And he's worthy to be celebrated. Because, man, if for nothing else, he's here and his love changes us. That is worthy of a party, in my opinion. So, I know some of you are stuck on that throw party stuff. So let me give you Bible. Go to Psalm 5, 11 and 12. Now, y'all forgive me, but this is in the Message Bible. Okay, and it is not what I recommend for your daily reading, but it is good to bounce off every now and again. So, you know, don't go home with King Jimmy and try to find this wording. You won't find it. (laughs) Watch this. But you will welcome us with open arms when we run for cover to you. Let the party last all night. Oh, man, I got something to say about that. Stand guard over our celebration. You are famous, God, for welcoming God seekers. For decking us out in your delight. Think about that. First of all, he's saying, you've you've welcomed us into your love. You are surrounding us. So the party ought to go all night long. I can tell you of some times I've been in the presence of God and the party went all night long. I can, ooh, I can tell you. I can tell you. I can tell you about a tent revival night when I never even saw my hotel room until 3.30 in the morning. Why? The party lasted all night. I came in. It was the night I turned 20. And I got as drunk in the Holy Ghost as you can imagine. I did not know my name. I was, as my father would say, two sheets to the wind. I ended up going off with the youth group, went to somebody's house and cast the devil out of her father. Then we went to Shoney's. I know some of y'all don't know nothing about no Shoney's. I know you know Shoney's. We went, I know some of y'all Southern folks know Shoney's, but we went on over to Shoney's. At 1.30 in the morning, somebody said, do you need to get back to the hotel? No, I need bacon. <laughs> so <laughs> we ate at Shoney's. The Holy Ghost hit us. Everybody at the table but me got slain out in the booth. One guy got up from being slain out in the booth, went back into the kitchen and laid hands on the cook. Yeah. Y'all think I'm, you think I'm crazy and lying. I'm telling you this is the gospel truth. Laid hands on the cook. And I don't know what he said, but he came out and he said, the cook said, thank you. And I was like, whoa. (laughs) So we, so we eat at Shoney's about 2.15 in the morning. They said, let's go pray for our school. Why not? (laughs) Drunk people don't make logical decisions. (laughs) 
So here comes a caravan of teenagers to the public school. And I said, let's stand in the parking lot and just ask for revival. So we're in the parking lot. And some dude said, no, lay hands on the building. So we all run over to the building and laid our hands on the school. And we just, watch this, it was not a flowery prayer. We put our hands on that school building and we just said, fire, fire. Now, if anybody's listening. <laughs> and so, now I'm starting to sober up a little bit. And I was like, wait, wait, hold up. I think, I think we need to call tonight, guys. So they're like, well, let's take so-and-so home before we take you back to the hotel. Okay, so we took this young lady home. We take her home and she gets in. Before you guys go, she goes, my parents aren't, aren't, even, aren't even here this weekend. Would you just come in and help me pray for their bedroom? Yes, we will. So we go in the house and we're hanging out and we're praying and we're prophesying to each other. You understand what I'm saying? Church started at 7. It is now 3 o'clock in the morning. With service that never ended. When we were done, I said, take me to the hotel, please. We did not have cell phones. We had no way to communicate. Get to the hotel. And now I'm like half drunk. Like I'm drunk enough to not care. Sober enough to be afraid. Y'all know what I'm saying? Walk into that hotel room. My father gets off his bed. Timothy! Now I know that does not mean praise God, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. What in the world? My mother grabbed his arm and said, oh, Ronnie, leave that boy alone. He's like, what do you mean leave him alone? It's 3.30 in the morning, and he just comes in here, and he don't even say hello. He don't say nothing. I mean, look at his face. My mother said, Ronnie, look at him. He's drunk. He better not be drunk. He's only 20. She goes, no. Look at his face. She said, ah, thank God for a hurricane that would settle the winds. She said, go to bed, baby. So I go to bed, and I don't care about nothing. I just go to bed. I went to say goodnight to my parents. The only thing came out was tongues. I got under the bed. I got under the covers. I fluffed my pillow, and I just prayed until it was morning. That next morning, I was exhausted. I hear my mother get up take her shower i hear my father get up and put on sports center that's how he got ready for revival he watched sports center <laughs> sorry dad and she said you you got to take a shower and so i was like still can't i can't speak a, i cannot speak a word I can now I, I can't tongues won't even come out like I got nothing so I, I just nod and I go and take my shower and then she I come out and she goes you got to put your suit on and I was like <laughs> and I just am laughing <laughs> and my mother said my god it's his 20th birthday and I'm still dressing this boy and she, she had to put my suit on. Thank God I was able to get my, my drawers on. Y'all know what I'm saying? It wasn't. Like, I just remember that part. But I couldn't. She handed me my tie, and I just laughed. So now here my father is, putting my tie on. My mother shaved me. I can't do anything. I'm slam drunk in the Holy Ghost. Get to church the next, that, that morning under the tent. Sat there. Went through worship. Couldn't even stand. 
I mean, I was, I mean, I was out. Worship ends, and the pastor gets up, and he goes, I just would love to hear from our evangelist son what happened last night, because I've heard. And he goes, all I know is devils went flying, the, church, the school got prayed for, and the cook at Shoney's got the Holy Ghost. I don't know what's going on. Everybody's laughing. And I was like, I'll tell you. So I got up there, on, honest, God is my witness, this is the truth. I couldn't even hold the microphone. I was, I was so out of it. And I began to tell what God did. And when I did, by the dozens, they ran to the altar. Fell on their face. Now, y'all, y'all don't, it, there was no grass. It was a sawdust floor. On their face in sawdust. Crying snot flying in the sawdust it was disgusting (laughs) and when the last person got prayed for was immediately sober what happened let the party last all night stand guard over our celebration i promise you i've never forgotten turning 20 in my lifetime some of us get nervous on a sunday morning when it's one o'clock 1 30 there have been some sundays two o'clock i realize this is not helping for people watching online trying to figure out if they want to come or not <laughs> 2 30 but can i tell you something If we would just lay our schedules on the altar, God will stand guard over our celebration. When he comes into the room, I don't want to be in such a hurry to get rid of him. I want to celebrate the fact that I know he doesn't walk into every church that way. So if he walks into this house, I want to host him well. And I want to have a... And you understand? Like he's the kind of person that shows up to the party not empty-handed. Right? Like he, he comes bearing gifts. He comes with good things. And all we have to do is receive from him. Just say, God, whatever you've got, I want it. Come on, say that. Whatever you've got, I want it. Give me more. I'm making room in my life. Give me more. Give me more. Give me more. Give me more. I want more anointing, more miracles, more salvation, more deliverance, more outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Mm. So, so why celebrate? Why celebrate? I want to give you four reasons why you can celebrate today. Number one, you're loved. Just as you are. Number two, you're forgiven. His loving kindness and his tender mercy is new every single morning. You're forgiven. Can I tell you something? Even when man won't forgive you, you're still forgiven. I'm loved and I'm forgiven. If I don't have any other reason right there, I got enough reason to celebrate. I'm loved and I'm forgiven. Certain people hate me. God loves me. I'm good with that. I'm good with that. God spoke to me long ago. He said, before I do what you've asked me to do, do you understand there's going to be people that ain't going to like you? And I said, but what about you? He goes, oh, I love you. (laughs) I had somebody come to me less than 10 years ago, and they, they said, I don't approve of how you minister to people i said really that was my response really i said you don't approve and they said no i i don't approve i think it's wrong and i said well thank you for giving me your opinion but i don't remember asking i didn't ask and i made a decision long ago 
people may not like me very much. But if one life gets changed, are you listening to me? If one life gets changed, it's worth it all. It's worth the criticism. This is what God, somebody needs to hear this. This is what God said to me years ago. He said, one man's criticism will become another person's compliment. Don't let the criticisms of man roll off your back like water off a duck's back. Just let them roll off of you. But if you're going to allow criticism to roll off of you, you also have to allow people's praise to roll off of you. And don't do anything based on what people are going to say or do. Just do what God tells you to do. And let the party last all night long. I pray to God, you get so full of this Holy Ghost celebration thing that it spills over into your living room. I pray you get in your house on a Sunday night and get into your kitchen to try to cook something yummy. And then all of a sudden you forget everything you was doing and you just hit the floor on your face and start praying in the Holy Ghost all over again. Because I want to tell you something and I, oh, I hate to say it. I don't want to scare nobody. And I don't want anybody to come to me and say, when's that going to happen? When's that going to happen? But I've seen in the spirit a time where everybody's schedules will have to be laid on the altar because Sunday morning for two hours just ain't going to be enough. And when our hunger demands it, I think God has taken us to a new level. That's what I believe. Now, I don't believe in let, the, let a church service. I, I, me and Kimber, we were in a service one time, and the pastor said, nobody's leaving before midnight. And it was 7 o'clock. And I'm sitting there thinking, five hours from now, brother, I'm going to be home eating something on my way to bed. Five hours. Y'all, how many, y'all, okay, are you with me? Okay. And so at about 10 o'clock, no, the presence of God had left the building. And we were like, we're good. And we're sitting there, we, we're sitting there. Now we're ministers and we're sitting there. We ain't staying to midnight. Like uh, we're done. We, we out. We got little kids. We need to get them home. You know, I was craving Wendy's. No offense, Bill. I was craving Wendy's. And I was like, yeah, let's take the kids to the drive-thru. Let's get home. We live 45 minutes away. So I said, Let, let's, let's get out of here. Let's go home. And then he gets up. Nobody leaves till midnight. I was like, why? Like, what's going on? Then his wife at 1030 got up, took their little kids and left. And I heard somebody ask her, where are you going? She goes, I'm putting these kids to bed. I ain't staying here to midnight. That was the pastor's wife. Then I was like, let's go. <laughs> Wendy's is still open in the drive-thru. I feel a Dave's double coming my way. Y'all know what I'm saying? Okay. <laughs> we are loved. We are forgiven. So I, I don't believe in, let's just have a long service. So the point of having a long service. But if what he's doing takes a long time, that's okay with me. Are you with me? Amen. Number three, we are healed. Number four, we're free. These are reasons why you have to celebrate God. These are reasons why we have, why some of us just rejoice. Besides the fact, the Bible says rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. I wasn't going to go here, but in, in uh, Luke chapter 10, Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like night lightning from heaven. Behold, I give unto you all power and authority, the trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. And then he, then he says, but do, not, but do not rejoice in this, but rejoice that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And then the next verse says, and in that hour... Jesus rejoiced in the spirit now I got curious one day and I said what's that mean Jesus rejoiced in the spirit does that mean Jesus was like that was good that was good you guys got this no it was when the 70 returned saying Lord even the demons are subject to us in your name we use your name demons start flying out and he goes yeah duh I saw Satan fall like lightning 
But don't rejoice in what you just saw. Rejoice that you're saved and that heaven is your home. And the Bible says, and in that hour, Jesus himself rejoiced in the spirit. So I got curious, so I looked it up in the Greek. Do you know what it means when it says Jesus rejoiced in the spirit? The word rejoice means to spin around with violent motion. Jesus got so excited that his disciples were going to be in heaven with him. Not excited that demons were flying out. Excited that the redeemed would be unified in heaven. That it got him so excited. Jesus spun like a top. What were the disciples thinking? Some of us would have been like, hmm, okay, Jesus is excited. Some of us others would have been like, he ain't going to be the only one to rejoice right now. (laughs) Amen. And if the master can spin around, why can't we? Is 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 this making any sense to anybody? Let me, let me close with this. I want you to say this with me. Now is the time time to celebrate. celebrate. (laughs) You see, here's the thing. Some of you had a hard week this week. Some of you went through some stuff. Some of you going through some stuff in your bodies. Some of you going through some things with your extended families. Some of you going through some things in your finances. Some of you just are just worried about the election. But let me tell you something. When you come in here. Everything that has tried to hold you down loses its power. As soon as you walk in this building, why? The king is in our midst. I don't have to have another deep reason to celebrate. The king's here. The king's here. You know, if we had certain people of influence walk in, there there would be a reaction. Whispering, gasping. Some of you would be bum rushing them. Hey, welcome to Victory Fellowship, you know? And it, 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 would, be, it would be quite an experience if we had, let's just say, somebody very well known walk in, right? Now, it depends who that person was as to what our reaction might be. The overwhelming majority of you would be like, whoa, if Patrick Mahomes walked in here on a Sunday morning. Y'all be sitting there, can I get your autograph? You know, and all sorts of, you know, why? It's just a natural human reaction, right? And if we had somebody of, of utmost importance walk in, people would respond to that. It's just, it's, it's human nature. People would respond to it. Can I tell you something? We have somebody in here every Sunday and every Wednesday that is greater than Patrick Mahomes. Greater than any politician. Greater than any celebrity. And he's worthy to be celebrated. I said he's worthy to be celebrated. Amen. He's worthy to be celebrated. Don't hold back. Well, that's not my personality. Well, first of all, you were supposed to die to yourself. Everything that I do in ministry goes against my personality. Some of y'all looking at me like you think I'm lying to you. It's the gospel truth. My whole life, my parents didn't even say, I don't know how God's going to use him. He's so bashful and backward and timid, don't want to say nothing to nobody, always runs and hides, stays in his room, locks his door, doesn't want to be around anybody. I would be in my room, 12, 13 years old, and my parents would have guests over, and they would say, come on out and say hello. So I would come out to the living room, put one foot inside the living room, and say, hi, and then back to my room I would go. (laughs) Scared to death of people. You think I'm lying. This is actually the truth. Was scared to death of people. One time in front of 350 people, my father called me out of the sanctuary onto the platform, puts a microphone, Jillian, in my face (laughs) and says, say something. So I looked at all of the people and I took the microphone and I said, 
something. <laughs> and I went and sat down. <laughs> uh, yeah, this guy. What happened? The Holy Ghost happened. Yeah. He, cha- he, changed, he changed the whole makeup of who I was and turned me into somebody that you see today. Some of you were thankful for that. Others, you're like, you know what? We could take a little quietness every now and again. (laughs) Let me give this to you real quick. This is why it's time to celebrate. Number one, his presence. Don't take it for granted, but celebrate his presence. Number two, celebrate because lives are changed. And if your life is one of the lives that's been changed, you've got a reason to celebrate. Listen to me. Some of you people that have been delivered from the utmost of strongholds in your life. Listen to me. Listen to what I'm going to tell you. Don't you ever let any religious person tell you it doesn't take all of that to work. If you've got to get to the altar and fall on your face, you do that. If you cry every time the presence of God moves, you do that. If it makes you shake and tremble and fall, you do that. And don't let anybody tell you that you're getting emotional. Because nobody knows what he brought you out of celebrate when lives are changed this is why i tell you when when people come forward for salvation this should be the loudest room in the whole county when people coming forward do you know it takes everything to get somebody to step out of their seat and walk to an altar and say here i am a sinner i need jesus and it should be celebrated When people come forward for salvation, there should be a thundering applause in this house as to the step that they're taking. You understand what I'm saying? That's what I'm talking about, celebration, when lives are changed. Celebrate that. Because you don't know what it took for them to step out and say, I'm ready. Not to mention, the Bible says that all of heaven throws a party over one sinner that repents. You understand that? Like, you could get a financial miracle, heaven doesn't throw a party. You can get healed in your body, heaven doesn't throw a party. You could have cancer shrivel up and die out of your body, heaven doesn't throw a party. But you step out and say, here I am, a sinner, and I acknowledge Jesus Christ as the truth, and I receive him as my Savior. And all of a sudden, angels start rejoicing and hooping and hollering. And all heaven throws into a party because one sinner said yes to Jesus. Right. Lives are changed. Number three, celebrate because the enemy's defeated. I mean, just, I mean, think about when David went up against Goliath. And how the entire army of Israel rejoiced when David took Goliath's sword and decapitated him. And then David went and picked it up and showed everybody how to get ahead. I want to make sure y'all are listening. You hadn't zoned out on me. But, but the point is, when the enemy was defeated, all of Israel rejoiced. They had a party. Matter of fact, Israel threw a party, and the Philistines ran in fear. Well, I, I, I guess. But one that tormented you worse than Goliath has been defeated. The devil is not going to be defeated. He already is defeated in Jesus' name. Amen. Say it with me. The devil's defeated. And I am victorious in Jesus' name. Number four, rejoice, celebrate, because the best is yet to come. Now, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this. In the last four and a half years, if we, if we take a, a look back, Jerry, at what God has done, there's been some incredible things happen in this place. When I look at, at just some of your testimonies of what God has done in your life, we have a reason to celebrate because of how amazing God has been. You know, like the miracles that have taken place in this place, the salvations that have taken place, 
the deliverances that are taking place on a weekly basis. Healing like we could have never imagined. And God growing this church little by little by little over and over and over. When we look at all that. And then he says, the best is yet to come. So I want to release something to you today that God has been releasing to me. And I want you to receive this by faith. We have yet to see what God will do when his people are hungry for him. He told me, you are yet to see how I can move. Because I still see in the spirit an internal struggle between hunger for God and being pulled in all these other directions in our everyday life. And if we will just ever yield to the pulling and the tugging of the Spirit, we are yet to see what God will do in this place. Now unto Him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we could ask or think, according to the power that works within us. I believe we are stepping into a brand new season in this house. I believe we're stepping into a season in God that if even he described it to us, we would have a hard time to imagine of what he was going to do in our midst. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask you, God, to come and take over this house. Lord, let us be a group a family of people that recognizes when you're in the room. Let us celebrate you, but God, let us celebrate the victories of our brother and our sister. Let us celebrate when somebody gets set free. Let us celebrate when somebody receives Christ. Let's celebrate when the backslider comes home. Let's celebrate when the prodigal returns to his father's house. Let us be a people that rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. We declare today that you are good. We do not take your presence for granted. But even on this day, we rejoice in you. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. 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 Let's stand to our feet real quick this morning. Amen. If you're taking medicine, it's 1208. Amen. I don't want you to miss a dose. Amen. I mean, do you receive what you got today? Is that okay? Because I think I think that's what what we need to understand. Some of us in this room need to know it's okay. To celebrate the good things of God. It's all right. It's all right. So it's okay to celebrate that. As a matter of fact, Scripture commands it to celebrate, to rejoice. And I believe God is throwing us a party. I, I'm just telling you, you, you may not like that terminology. I don't care. I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just being honest. I don't care if you don't like the terminology. I like the terminology. Otherwise, I wouldn't have said it. 